Uh, so, hi everyone, uh, my name is Thor. I'm also known as uh, Codenson. Um, you can find me on the web as codenson.dev. Um, this isn't a spelling mistake, there are two R's in my name uh, and two N's in the nickname. Uh, and I'm gonna talk um, about this thing that I made um, called Aetherspace. Um, so, what's, why should you listen to this talk? Why is this interesting? Um, well, uh, this is actually the second time I've, I'm giving this talk. Um, the first time was all the way back in November, um, which most of you will probably know, uh, the, the month that Elon Musk took over Twitter. That's kind of the narrative we'll be following uh, for this talk as well. Um, but also, um, just like uh, many of you, I am uh, a maker at heart. Uh, and one of my all-time favorite uh, projects was this um, round air hockey table that we, that we built. Um, essentially just two uh, plastic um, plates uh, on, top, on top of each other. Uh, you put a leaf blower uh, at the bottom, uh, drill some holes uh, at the top. Um, and the whole idea was that we wanted to um, be able to play with both physical and digital pucks. So uh, as you can see, there's also these beams that go up to the top, uh, put a projector there uh, and like an old uh, PlayStation eye camera uh, that we use for color tracking. So the paddles that you had, uh, they had these brightly colored uh, dots at the top. Um, and that way we could like track where your physical handle was, track where uh, the pucks uh, were and see if they were interacting with any of the digital pucks uh, as well. Now, of course, um, you can't build, make a living from building really cool um, air hockey tables. Um, so these days, um, I, uh, since then basically, um, I am just working uh, with TypeScript as a front-end and back-end uh, engineer uh, with like a fully JavaScript slash uh, TypeScript uh, stack. Um, these are some of the technologies we work with. Um, we have stuff like Capacitor, which is a way to bring um, building for the web to mobile as well, um, but that's not what I specify in. Um, I am more speci uh, specialized in combining uh, Expo and Next.js. Um, Expo is a way to use React um, and more uh, mostly React Native um, to build uh, mobile apps in a cross-platform way uh, <coughs> for iOS and Android. Uh, now our backends are uh, usually written uh, at Baldur's, the company I work for, uh, written in Node.js, uh, which is just JavaScript for the server. Um, and we use a framework called Nest.js uh, to get some like opinionated ways uh, to write our uh, APIs with Node.js. Um, but after hours, I do still tinker. Um, the past few years, um, I have really zoomed in into um, combining Expo and Next.js, um, and, uh, which has led to this thing uh, called Aetherspace, which is a React meta framework uh, that I made. Um, I've also done some other open source contributions to uh, date, date functions, for example, um, but most of my time really goes into, into uh, this. So what does Aetherspace uh, do for you? Um, to f explain what it, it does for you, um, let's follow along with like an app idea. Um, we're all searching for uh, an alternative to Twitter, so um, let's see if we can uh, build one with uh, Aetherspace. So since we're building an alternative to Twitter, um, that does mean we're competing with Elon Musk and like all the existing features that Twitter has. Um, so essentially from the start, if you're a solopreneur, if you're a small team, um, or it's just even a larger team, um, you're playing feature catch up. You're gonna need to move fast to get to the same point that uh, Twitter, Twitter uh, is at. Uh, aside from that, Twitter also has more reach. Um, not just, I mean, most importantly for them, uh, all the people they've already onboarded into their, um, 
their platform, but um, also it's available on the web, it's available on iOS, it's available on Android. Um, if you're taking yourself seriously as a competitor to them, um, you're going to have to go cross-platform as well. Now, um, you could think, oh, can we um, MVP this, start with just web, and then later we'll add in um, iOS and Android supports. Um, you could, um, but there's a 100% chance if you're building something worthwhile uh, of getting comments like these, um, not just from your competitors, uh, but from genuinely interested users as well. Um, Elon has a point here, and to hammer this home, I'm going to show uh, a one-minute clip from another conference called AppJSConf um, that really uh, nails this. Here's a graph, and it's basically showing how people use the internet, broken down on desktop versus mobile. And you can see the dark lines of the mobile thing just keep going up, like, and it's still going up, and maybe even accelerating. And it's basically just people are using their mobile phones more and more. I don't really need to show you this graph to convince you of that, probably. But if you just look around, you think about your own behavior, your family, whatever, all of you are probably using your mobile phones more and more every week, every year. And more things, you know, if you played Fortnite, you probably played it on PC a couple years ago. And then if it weren't banned from the App Store, you'd be probably playing it on iPad now or something like that. Like, these things are just happening. Um, and then what people are doing with their mobile phones is that they're using apps instead of websites. Um, this particular study I found said that 90% of mobile time is spent in apps and only 10% is on the rest of the internet. And that's pretty congruent with what I see in my own behavior. And so the weird thing about all this, though, is like if you think about what developers are doing, they're not building apps at the same rate they're building websites. Developers are still building websites all the time. Like here's a graph that shows that like literally 15 times as many downloads are happening for React DOM instead of React Native. And it's not just React DOM and React Native. This is just true. Like think about how many native developers you know or app developers you know, and think about how many people you know who build websites all the time. We all probably know like 10 times as many people that build websites somehow. And so there's this weird, weird thing where like all these people want to, like people everywhere want to use apps. They want that rich behavior. They want the interactions. They want the smoothness. They want to use the full power of their devices. They want all the things that come with apps for using. But then for building, we're all still building websites for some reason, or almost all of us. All right, so if you think about it, if you want to build for the way users want to use software, what you really want is uh, an app in the Play Store and uh, the, apps, the Apple App Store. Now, um, if you're competing with an existing technology, you'll likely you likely won't want to build this uh, with two different teams uh, that wouldn't be cost or time efficient. Um, so you would um, probably want to go with like a cross-platform framework. Um, like a flutter uh, is a route you could go. Um, I specialize in React Native, so that's the one uh, we chose at Bothers uh, and that I chose personally uh, as well. But the fact that um, users want to use mobile apps doesn't mean you can't still benefit from the web. Um, because um, when you think about it, web equals uh, organic traffic to whatever solution you're providing. Um, because if you're looking for a solution, like more recently, you might just go to ChatGPT. Um, but a lot of people will still go to a Google, uh, and if you rank high in Google, um, they will end up on your solution, from which you can then guide them to your uh, application, uh, which has been proven to be um, a bit better at uh, driving conversions. Um, the performance is usually a bit better, especially on mobile, like mobile browsers. Uh, if you try to have like really appy, swipey behavior, it's not always as performant. Um, and um, things like in-app transactions, they, they continue to rise year over year. Um, so this is a trend that's set to uh, continue. So how would you actually um, start in this hybrid first way, building for web, iOS, Android. Um, if you know a bit of TypeScript and uh, React, I would suggest um, combining Expo and Next.js. Um, how do you actually combine these? Um, you could start with um, each of the frameworks, um, like 
starter uh, template and try to then add, uh, for example, like for web, you could start with an XGS starter, try to add mobile to that. Um, for mobile, you could go with like the Expo CLI um, and then try to add web support and uh, server-side rendering to that. But um, the clock is ticking. Uh, because you are, again, you are competing with Twitter, um, it's probably going to save you a bunch of time to just go with a cross-platform uh, template. Um, basically, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, if time is of the essence, um, you would want to outsource um, this setup with um, something like Aether Space, which is a template repo, um, or um, there are other honorable mentions uh, in this space, like Solido.dev is um, a well-known one in the, in the Expo and Next.js community. Um, there's a lesser known one called Create, Create T3 Turbo, um, but it is also more opinionated. It makes more decisions for you that you might not necessarily want. Um, but both of these are pretty good alternatives. But, um, you're competing with Twitter, you're gonna need a bunch more engineers. Um, and you'll need to think about um, like what systems can we put in place uh, so that they can communicate efficiently. Um, basically, you don't want um, people that are onboarded on the pro, uh, on the uh, <coughs> on the project to start reinventing the wheel themselves. Um, if there's like no documentation, um, people do tend to think, um, hey, I could probably do this um, better myself. Um, so you would want a way to share some common building blocks and uh, document ways of working. Um, and ideally, you're not just writing docs all the time. You want to find an easy way uh, of doing that. Um, again, just to not, if you want to go fast, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, and Storybook has a great um, quote for this, um, that documentation drives adoption. If people know what's going on, if people know what's, um, what's available, if they know how to use it, um, they, will, they will be more inclined to use that than um, build it again themselves. Uh, and this is kind of where uh, Aetherspace excels and um, some of the other templates uh, tend to fall uh, a bit short. Um, because I did not just want to build um, a, a, another boilerplate that helps, helps you get set up with XY and XGS. I wanted to also um, make sure that you could spend as little time but, um, documenting your components, but um, still get really um, good documentation from that. Uh, and the tool I used for that is uh, Storybook. Um, so if you go into the Aetherspace Quick Starts, um, <coughs> I'll uh, tell you where to find this page uh, later. Um, the way that you hook into this like automatic documentation generation uh, with Aetherspace is, um, first of all, um, if you name your component, uh, uh, the file it's in, in a specific way, you need to export it in, under the same name. Um, you need to um, describe your data structure um, for basically the configuration for your components uh, in a specific way. Um, this is very similar to TypeScript, um, where you can just say, oh, uh, I'm expecting a name property. It's going to be a string. It can, it's optional. You could describe what it does. Um, and you can also apply stuff like uh, defaults. Oh, if there's also a value property, it's not going to be string, it's going to be number. If it's not um, passed in when using the component, let's just default this to one. Um, and then similar to how uh, Next.js has these um, ways of working to like opt into server-side rendering or opt into um, static export, um, we also have um, a specific export you can define um, to opt into automatic documentation generation uh, by basically assigning your description of um, your properties um, to a get documentation props export. Um, when running the project, this then gets picked up by uh, 
the, the scripts uh, that Aerospace has, and it will um, spit out some storybook files for you. So you don't need to craft these yourselves. Um, you basically just do these three steps and it, it will generate documentation for you. Um, and these uh, .stories, .mdx files um, are basically just markdown with JSX um, enabled. Um, so a recurring theme with um, this framework that I made is that I would I, I like to take what already works and then make it better. Um, and one way we did this for the, the documentation generation is um, we took what works. Uh, so the way you describe your um, data structure is with this schema validation library called Zot. Um, we added extra features to it so that you can also, uh, so that it can also be used to generate documentation um, from these definitions. Now, Zod in itself um, is built TypeScript first. Um, it is a schema validation library, so you can parse um, whatever inputs you have uh, or, or validate them. Um, but what do I mean with TypeScript first? Like it will, um, you can infer types from it, and uh, for example, here in comments, uh, a z dot string dot optional will translate exactly in TypeScript to uh, a string or undefined, for example. So, what do these um, generated storybook files uh, look like? Um, well, first of all, let's have a look at the sidebar. Uh, you can see there's a bunch of markdown documentation where you have your ways of working, um, but it also lists all the features and all the components. Um, so for example, under app core, I have this icons folder. Um, all these icons are opting into uh, this automatic uh, documentation generation. Um, and when you click on either, so this is how you know what's available. Uh, if you click on any of those, um, you'll see an import path if you want to use that. Um, you'll see a preview of what the component uh, looks like. Um, and then most importantly, uh, from the data structure that you defined, um, you'll see an overview of all the different properties. So with height, fill, uh, in this case, uh, a description of it, if you provided one, the type that results from it. Uh, if there are defaults, it'll list the defaults. Um, and then this is re a really powerful feature in Storybook, um, is that you have these controls. Um, so the default may be 24, um, but if you wanna check what your uh, component looks like with another value, you can just, um, for example, uh, put this uh, to 240, uh, make it really big. Um, the preview will update automatically. You can give it another color. Um, they have controls for every type of um, like data structure uh, that you can imagine. Um, but you, we were promised um, an Expo and Next.js project and more specifically um, a mobile app and a web app. Um, so this, is what um, the default Aetherspace boilerplate uh, comes with uh, as an example. Basic boilerplate stuff, um, we render an image um, which on the web is just uh, using next image which is already optimized for the web underneath. Um, while um, on mobile this is using React Native's um, own image component. Uh, <coughs> And then we have um, some, some text. Um, again, in React Native, this is just gonna be a text element. Um, nothing fancy about that. But uh, on web, if you want to, you can apply hierarchical, um, like uh, your H1 tags, your H2 tags, um, stuff like that, so that the page is basically optimized for uh, SEO. Um, then you have icons for every um, single part of the stack. Um, I've called this the green stack because you have GraphQL, uh, you have React Native, you have Expo and Next.js. Yes. Um, Electron used to be part of this, but now it's just Expo doing pulling uh, double the weight. Um, then we're, uh, you can open these to learn more about them. We're not gonna do that. Um, and we guide the user to the specific um, file that's rendering this um, example page uh, where you can 
edit it or most likely just throw it out instead uh, and start writing your own UI. Um, then we have um, buttons verifying that we have a REST endpoint up and running. It's just a simple um, test whether the server is alive and kicking. Um, same thing for um, GraphQL, uh, where you get like the playground to uh, play around with everything, your, um, uh, all the data resolvers you uh, provide. Um, and then this is where it gets uh, pretty interesting. This is one of the hardest problems to solve when combining uh, Expo and Next.js is uh, navigation. So in the browser, um, you just um, navigate through your URLs, uh, your basic links. But um, on uh, mobile, um, you have this concept of stacks where uh, layers, all your screens are basically layered on top of each other and you push um, a new screen on, uh, on the stack or you pop it off if you wanna go uh, to the previous one. And then in the end, we have uh, a link to the docs. So um, how would you go about building your own UI uh, for your Twitter killer app? Um, well, um, we, the whole point of the, the uh, meta framework is essentially to um, write all your codes as uh, single use as possible. Um, so the uh, Aether space provides some primitives, um, just few text uh, images uh, and some others um, that you can uh, then style with Tailwind. Um, went with Tailwind uh, specifically uh, because it's one of the more popular ways to style uh, these days. Um, if you're uh, familiar with Bootstrap uh, for CSS, it's kind of like that, but 10 times better. Uh, in my opinion. Um, so for example, um, you get this Tailwind prop, um, you uh, assign like PX to translate to oh, padding on the vertical, um, on the horizontal axis uh, of two times uh, four. Now that can be pretty abstract and that is a valid criticism uh, that people have of Tailwind. Um, and most people, like th it makes it a bit hard to read sometimes, uh, unless you already know Tailwind, um, which I would say worth the investment of learning. But uh, sometimes you wanna go really specific and uh, you can then use this, these, this bracket syntax um, where you basically specify, for example, the max width um, should be exactly 100 pixels. You have stuff like oh, uh, centering, you can apply rounded corners, um, and the way it does um, uh, media queries for your responsive um, designs is you apply these uh, prefixes like LG for oh, as soon as it's uh, seen as a larger screen, uh, apply like large texts, for example. Um, then there's um, custom styles as well. Um, I added one for uh, the font. Um, so this one doesn't come with Tailwind out of the box. Uh, you can still add your own um, stylings. Um, and the reason that I mentioned uh, media queries um, specifically uh, is that um, the regular way of combining Expo and Next.js or bringing React Native to the web um, is through React Native Web, which does not really support um, media queries out of the box. Um, but with these primitives uh, provided by Aetherspace, it does work, uh, so we have you covered. So quick recap, um, or why are we doing this? Why are we providing our own primitives? Um, when you think about it, um, all UI is built from some form of primitives, like a shape, like a view, like uh, a text, like an image. And if uh, these primitives that you use to build all your UI with um, are already optimized for um, the server, for the browser, for iOS, and for Android, um, then anything you build with them will uh, mostly also already be optimized for each of these platforms. 
Um, for example, React Native already uh, kind of does this for you um, for providing uh, write once code with Android and iOS. Uh, in, uh, for iOS, for example, in Xcode, if you have a, a closer look, um, you'll see that this uh, is not like trying to bring web technology um, to, to uh, mobile apps in like some kind of iframe uh, web view way. Um, these are actual um, underneath um, like UI layers um, that you would otherwise use to build uh, an, an iOS standalone uh, native app. Um, but that uh, can sound like uh, if you're going the other way around that you're trying to um, bring uh, mobile tech to the web, um, which can raise concerns uh, like from your competitors um, about, uh, hey, does this still mean you're optimized uh, to rank high in uh, Google? Is your, is your page SEO and Web Vitals uh, optimized then? Um, now, it is um, it for if you um, use specific um, HTML elements. Um, so again, uh, taking what works, making it better. There's uh, Expo already has their own uh, HTML elements, um, and Airspace just adds um, the styling and uh, server-side media query supports uh, to that. Um, so basically tiny wrappers around uh, what already works. So on the web, um, if you use any of these articles, sections, uh, H2 titles, uh, paragraph tags, um, this will actually render um, the semantic HTML uh, that you need for your page. While on mobile, um, SEO is not important at all. Uh, it will just render views, texts, uh, which then, as I just showed, gets turned into actual native UI by React Native. Um, all right, and one um, decision I'd like to zoom in on is uh, the choice to go for Next.js because um, Next.js does uh, collaborate with um, like the, the Chrome uh, developers team um, to think about, hey, if we want to really zoom in on these web vitals, um, then this is like the, the you, don't, you can't just go for an image tag these days. Uh, you need to think about this extensive list um, of things to, to, to think about. Um, and with Next.js, they build their own components to really uh, kind of automate that as well or make it much simpler in any case. Um, so that's way easier to build optimized uh, websites. So server-side rendering is nice, but what about the rest of your backend? Basically, um, Elon is asking if we even have APIs that you can charge uh, 42K uh, a month for. Um, well, as I uh, showed in the little demo, um, we do have uh, a REST and GraphQL uh, resolver set up. So how would you uh, build these. Again, uh, this is where Zod uh, comes in. Um, you have your single sources of truth um, for your, like your inputs and your uh, responses. Um, and you don't just get your um, validation from that or your types. Um, you get your documentation and uh, stuff like GraphQL schemas. If you think about it, if you didn't have a single source of truth, um, if you wanted all, all these four things, you would have to define your data structure four times, which uh, runs the risk of those getting out of sync. Um, and then, it, for example, if it's in your types, uh, then you're basically lying to the other developers, leads to bugs, um, stuff like that. It's also uh, time intensive to write it four times. Uh, you'd like to avoid it if you could. Um, so, as I said, um, use Zod um, to define the arguments, the inputs, um, use it to define the response as well. Um, business logic wise, like a really simple use case is just um, like, oh, I want to um, add an echo argument and anything I put into that argument, it could echo back to me. 
um, you then combine um, your uh, data structure definition for both your input and your response, and you, by wrapping with um, a helper called an ADA resolver, um, which this part is just your business logic, you get the argument, you return it, um, and then combining that with the definition for your uh, input and output, you get this neat little bundle that has business logic and um, expected input, expected output uh, bundled together. This is just another JavaScript function um, in the end that you get as a result. So any other resolvers you write can still um, use this as a regular promise and can be awaited uh, somewhere. Um, to then uh, make um, like a GraphQL resolver from that bundle, you wrap um, the result of this in another uh, utility, export it with a specific name, uh, and this will then become available in uh, GraphQL. Um, same thing essentially for uh, API routes with Next.js. Um, where you can then add um, extra options like your middleware, uh, stuff like that. So this is an example of what this looks like in uh, GraphQL. And if you go pretty far in describing your single source of truth, um, like providing um, <coughs> a description of what uh, specific fields do, um, this will also show up in uh, your GraphQL. So GraphQL by, by itself is already self-documenting. Uh, as you can see here, you have an overview of the, of the schema, there's a docs tab. Um, so taking all of that together, um, then, uh, or just to recap, basically, for your resolvers, um, you can write any business logic, whether it interfaces with Firebase, with Airtable, with Notion, with OpenStreetMaps, um, whatever. You wrap, it, you wrap that business logic with an ADA resolver, tie it to um, a schema for your arguments and your response, and from that you can generate uh, an API route, uh, a GraphQL resolver, and your function is still just called so going through all of these steps uh, in the quick start, um, they provide us with some um, pretty uh, powerful results. We have hybrid components that are styled with Tailwind but are actually native on iOS and Android. Um, on the web, they're optimized for SEO. Um, we have stuff like media queries, responsive design that also uh, are easily supported. Um, we can auto-generate a storybook. Um, and together with then uh, the lower part of this, um, you also have your APIs uh, that are also write once, uh, but still REST or GraphQL. Um, and to tie those two worlds together, um, we have single sources of truth for all our properties, uh, our arguments, our responses, our documentations, our types, and our defaults. Now, Meanwhile, uh, some of you may have noticed that a few weeks ago, uh, Twitter was down because uh, they weren't subscribed to their own uh, API plan, which of course leaves Elon to think, why did I pay $42 billion for this? Um, well, Elon made a grave mistake of laying off too many developers and um, the risk you're running when you're um, laying off a lot of people at the same time, or if there's not enough documentation, um, is that integral bits of, of, of like working knowledge uh, aren't shared, um, and then when those things break, um, it becomes really hard to fix uh, or figure out what's going on. So eventually we can all expect this to happen, uh, and we will have uh, we will be ready to take in some, uh, some, some users jumping ship uh, from Twitter. So some disclaimers um, about uh, Aether space is um, for every tool, you also need to know when not to use it. Um, if, you're, like, in, if you're building the next Spotify, for example, um, you're, it's very likely you will be needing uh, like cutting edge new native features. Um, now. Uh, why isn't Aetherspace cut out for this? Um, because React Native takes a while to get support for cutting edge native features. Um, then Expo takes a while to get up to date. Uh, like a while is maybe 
strong wording, uh, usually like a few weeks or sometimes months uh, to get to the, let's, to the latest React Native work, uh, version. Um, and then uh, Aether Space itself um, isn't always immediately up to date with the latest uh, Expo version. Um, I do try to do that within like the week or uh, two weeks. Um, but uh, of course, if you're not a fan of React or TypeScript or uh, monorepos, monorepos are just the best way these days to combine um, Expo and XGS, um, then this will also obviously not be uh, the tool for you. Um, if you're too far into a project, um, then it's probably not worth migrating. Um, it, it would be, I don't know, the, the existing uh, code would probably be too different. Uh, you need to change all your primitives, uh, not really an easy job. I might look into adding some code mods if you're just coming from um, React Native, but so far uh, no, no real effort has been uh, put into that. Um, and then next to that, um, of course, um, this thing I made, well, everything that I just uh, talked about in the slides and uh, that uh, is listed in the quick start, uh, while that all works, um, I do still consider this like early access. Uh, it's kind of in beta preview mode. Um, because if you want to do a deep dive into specific stuff, uh, I am still actively writing documentation for this. So again, uh, if you, when you should use it from a business perspective, if you want uh, the best of both wor worlds, uh, you want organic web traffic, then Next.js is like the first class in um, search engine optimization. Um, but if you want um, more conversions in your mobile apps, um, doesn't have to be sales. Just think of any uh, call to action you have. Um, the native usually does drive uh, higher conversions. Um, and essentially what you want is like a handover from organic traffic from web uh, to your mobile app. From a developer perspective, if you already know React and you would like to take that cross-platform, um, the existence of um, these uh, HTML elements that Agerspace comes with could be a way um, to explore uh, mobile development as well. Um, if you want to build for how um, users prefer um, to use software, then this is a way to go. Um, of course, Expo, Next.js, uh, if, you if you've thought about combining those, this is the way to go. Um, if you don't want to spend uh, time writing documentation, but you do want documentation, um, our automation uh, helps with that. And um, if you want to experiment with some cutting edge uh, new features um, from both Expo and uh, Next.js, uh, like the app directory or uh, Expo Router, which is a really cool project where you, um, similar to Next.js, have like file-based routing, um, but for mobile uh, navigation, um, first of it, really the first of its kind, um, then, Aether space can be a way to get set up quickly just, just so you can experiment with it. So you can find me uh, as Codinson um, and, on <coughs> and on my website, um, if you click the GitHub or React icons, uh, this will uh, take you to the uh, beta preview um, Aether space uh, <coughs> uh, repo. Um, if you'd like to revisit this talk, I've also done uh, a write-up in uh, blog form uh, that you can find on uh, dev.2. Any questions? All right, that was it.